We like to show off our stuff. Whether it is our fancy clothes, how many elephants we have, our big melons, Air Jordans, or the fancy tiles in our kitchen, showing off our stuff makes us feel good about our place in the world. Artists too are interested in stuff. In this video we are going to investigate if there is something we can learn about artistic thinking by looking at a genre of painting known as still life. Our view will be limited and a little artificial because making broad generalizations about art and artists is problematic at best. But nevertheless, within these artificial categories we may learn something about what some artists were thinking and how that thinking shows us something about the zeitgeist. We're going to focus on Western art because painting stuff seems more important there than in Eastern art. We'll explore why in a minute. But a quick view of classical art from Greece and Rome shows that artists were interested in showing the ideal of rational humanism. When the Roman Empire fell, Europe slid into a period known as the Dark Ages, where myth and superstition held sway. Art was more interested in portraying these stories than it was with showing reality. Eventually, the political situation began to stabilize and we enter a time known as the Renaissance, where the ideals of humanism return and art returns to becoming more representational. Concurrent with this change in philosophies was the development of global trade. Partly why Europe rebounded from the Dark Ages was the colonization that brought much wealth to Europe and gave rise to a wealthy merchant class. While Europe was still a religious continent, materialism began to have an effect and with it a rising secularism. The wealth this merchant class acquired gave them political power. It also gave them the means to hire artists to immortalize them and their cool new stuff. In a backlash against the Catholic Church during the Protestant Reformation of the 16th century, the Dutch Reformed Church made images of religious subjects forbidden. Many Dutch artists bridged the secular and religious worlds by using objects to symbolize religious ideals. Even though artists were dependent on their rich patrons, some artists worked in symbols of the fleeting nature of life and worldly pleasures in a type of still life known as vanitas which was meant to remind that in the end, rich or poor, everyone is mortal. Flowers became a symbolic subject matter for the cycle of life. Let's listen in as art historians Pippa Couch and Rachel Ropiek discuss Jan von Heysom's Vase with Flowers. So we are at Dulwich Picture Gallery in London and we are standing in front of Jan van Heysom's Vase with Flowers from about 1720. It's quite a vase, it's quite a lot of flowers that we've got here. Yeah, it's bombastic colour spilling out, overflowing, isn't it? It's not a neat flower arrangement that your grandmother might have slaved over, is it? Little sprigs going off every which way and flowers leaning and, and lots of contrast between kind of the bright white and light coloured flowers and then these really deep shadowed kind of darker coloured flowers. And the painting, I mean, when standing here in front of it, really holds up under a microscope. I mean, it's like we're looking through a microscope. All the detail you have on the leaves. You have a leaf here with a bee on it and there's a, a raindrop. And you look at the raindrop, it's magnifying tiny lines of the leaf underneath it. You've got ladybirds, butterflies, all that, just the activity. And the velvety, velvety texture you feel on that tulip. Yeah, you do feel like... If you touched it, it would feel like a real tulip. And imagining how painstaking it must have been to paint that with these tiny, tiny little brushes, yeah, you know, one been, and two hairs. Yeah, it must have been just a few, right? And it's interesting as well, because although it's just flowers, there's definitely something else going on in the picture here, I think. If you look down here, we have a, a bird's nest. And in there, we've got eggs, the beginning of life. You can follow this idea of the life cycle, because there are eggs in this bird's nest, which keeps kind of drawing the eye with this incredible attention to detail. And then kind of hiding in the flowers, there's this little naked boy who is, I think, supposed to be painted on the vase, probably. Yeah, it looks like he's running around the back <laughs> of the vase there. It doesn't look going on from that. Well, yeah, so we have like birth and then beginning of youth and looking at all the arrangement of flowers, they're not all in full bloom. So some are budding, some are spring coming to life. Some are in bombastic bloom, like these big red chrysanthemums or whatever it is in the middle there. And then further away, the ones in the back in the shade are in the shadow, the sunset of life. The leaves are falling off, they're browning. Yeah. And so it does seem to represent the cycle. Maybe it's just me, but my eye does keep coming back to that nest. And after death, that cycle renews itself and starts again mm -hmm. with the egg. Again. So you've got the dead twigs and then the birth. Mm -hmm. And like you were saying, thinking about the flowers, I don't know if all of these flowers would necessarily be in bloom at the same time in the year. Yeah, I think that's sort of typical of Dutch still life flower painting at the time. 
which is including this idea of the cycle of the seasons mirroring the cycle of birth and death and life. And the detail, you just, if you had this on your wall at home, you just keep coming back to it, wouldn't you? You'd never get bored with it. There's just more and more detail in there you can find. Each time I look, I see a butterfly, another little insect burrowing around in there. And these red ones at the top, I mean, they look like Chinese lanterns. And I do think this is a really good one to play scavenger hunt with and find something new every time because you can keep looking for more and more detail and just keep kind of digging in deeper and deeper. Still life painting proved to be quite a popular genre during this time. It not only served the vanity of the rich, it reflected a renewed interest in keenly observing nature, which led to intellectual revolution in both art and science. By the 18th century, Europe had entered into a period known as the Age of Enlightenment, where the idea that we could know the world through the use of reason was prominent. This gave rise to many paradigm shifts in science, politics, economics, and art. The Industrial Revolution saw the development of capitalism as the primary economic model in both Europe and a new country, the United States. Materialism was on the rise in the West. A fixation on stuff was here to stay. In the 19th century, France was the center of the art world. The French Academy set the standards for what was acceptable in art. However, not to be left behind in this atmosphere of revolution brought about by the Age of Enlightenment, there were some artists who rejected this academic style and began to explore other possibilities in painting. A group of artists who later became known as the Impressionists began to explore the effect that light had on visual experience. Their style often used a looser brushwork to depict the way light was perceived by the eye. Along with the development of the new technology of photography, this began to free artists up from representing nature and allowed them to explore and express a more subjective relationship with it. Artists like Van Gogh and Gauguin began using form and color symbolically. Another artist, Paul Cezanne, would approach form in such a radical way that it would profoundly influence the next generation of European artists and change the very nature of art. We're on the fifth floor of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City and we're looking at Paul Cezanne's Still Life with Apples from 1895 to 1898. Right, the three-year span suggests that he worked on this uh, repeatedly over the course of several years. Except it's not finished. No, not at all. In several areas, in fact, the canvas is quite bare, and the rest of it is quite sketchy. It's really sketchy, and you're right. The, the, this tablecloth in the foreground is just, well, it's not raw canvas, but sized canvas. Mm -hmm. The drapery on the upper left is the same. Uh, the pitcher on the right side, lots of the white canvas coming through. And even the areas which are painted seem as if it's only a preliminary first coat. I think we could say that it was badly drawn. Yes, you know, I mean, absolutely. If the pitcher is tipping to the left. Um, the ellipse that forms the, the edge of the bowl is, is completely sort of deformed, and the glass the, the edge of the glass, as we, we seem to look down at the glass, even yeah. as we look across at it, um, much too much. Yeah, and these, the, the fruit on the table to, looks like it should fall off. You know, there's, there's no so sense Cezanne, of gravity. So Cezanne could draw beautifully, yes. and according to the traditions of the 19th century. So this is purposeful, and it's, it's, it's this deliberate what? It's a deliberate breaking open of the possibilities of what painting could be here at the close of the 19th century. I think an idea that the tradition of European painting, of it being a, a very mimetic, very real image that reflected the, what the artist saw, I, I think that that had, was obviously completely bankrupt well, by so the late 1880s and 1890s. Because the still life itself, as a subject, is a, first of all, lowly. It had not had any real significance since the 17th century. And he's resurrecting the, the still life as a form. But if you think about the still life, that was one of the attributes of the still life in the 17th century was a kind of really heightened naturalism. And, That's and, true. And, and How so real everything could look. If you look at the yep. sort of the Dutch tradition, um, yep. and yet Cezanne is sort of going at this in a very different way. Entirely different. So, so linear perspective and, the tra and those traditions of hyper-realism as they had been refined over the centuries right. into the 19th century was very much still dominant. And yet Cezanne here is not finishing the canvas, is, is playing fast and loose with drawing, and is creating a, an environment that I think is 
per very perplexing, must have been extremely perplexing for viewers in the 19th century, but even for us, creates a kind of tentativeness when we look at it. I yeah? think he's finding his way. I think he knows that the, those traditions are bankrupt, and I think he's looking for a, another way to paint. And another way to see. And another way to and, see, and, and I, another way to experience. Well, that's, that's true. It. That's it, because I think there's also an implicit invitation here to move into this canvas visually, in a sense, the way he experiences this, these forms. And, you know, in the, in the 19th century, according to the traditions uh, that had been in place for so long, the artist would stand in a particular point in space and make sure that everything was in accord with that perspectival right. point. Right. But what Cezanne seems to be doing is to allow us to move through the canvas and to, in a sense, experience it as we might as our vision actually begins to meander. Mm -hmm. Is it possible here that Cezanne is actually giving us a series of pathways and alternatives and a more complex set of views? I, th I think it is. I think that the bigger question here is how that becomes important or why that becomes important at the dawn of the 20th century, at the end of the 19th century, that something about the experience of the individual, something about the subjectivity of the experience of space, of time, of seeing, I think that the weight of those things and the bankruptcy of that mimetic tradition, that copying of nature tradition, um, you know, something about those issues becomes really critical at the end of the 19th century. Cezanne's radical way of looking at painting opened the doors for artists to experiment in ways that had never been considered before. His influence on modern painting would only be eclipsed by a young Spaniard. We're here in MoMA storage with Pablo Picasso's glass, guitar, and bottle of 1913. He, along with other Cubist painters, notably Georges Braque and Joan Gris, had begun to introduce non-art materials into their fine art pictures, things like wallpaper or newspaper, a few snippets of which you see here. By contrast, what Picasso sets the task of doing is trying to build the collage of paint. The result is really one of Picasso's most complex paintings of the Cubist period in terms of its facture and the variety of its surface effects. So he used all these different tools and devices to manipulate his, his paint, stencils, bits of cardboard to push up against the edges of paintings, these very sharp, distinct lines. Sometimes he would use, with a stencil that was cut, the jagged edges of his scissors right, would be translated over in, into the paint. Our conservators suspect that in some areas creating skins of paint, skins of white lead paint, and then literally applying those in these shape contours to the surface of this. So actually taking the material of paint and making it a, a collage element, literally. The Paris surrealists, um, people like Louis Aragon and André Breton, always insisted, in fact, that paste and paper were not essential to the making of collage. They really described collage as an operation that set out to produce a work of art that wasn't a seamless unity, that wasn't a coherent whole, that made you so forcefully apparent of the, the constructed nature. Picasso's always engaged with this game of the true and the false, the vrai and the faux, reality and illusion, and this picture sort of ups the ante of that game in this way that is absolutely remarkable. The development of Cubism led by Georges Braque and Pablo Picasso revolutionized the way painting dealt with form. Picasso and Braque were trying to show something as it was, not the way it looked. Their efforts to show all aspects of something simultaneously on a flat picture plane eventually led to a whole new way of understanding what a painting was. The arrangement of the formal elements themselves expressed the artist's approach to this abstract notion of reality. Traditional subject matter, like people, flowers, and fruit, became simply a secondary vehicle for trying to depict the abstract idea of being. Depicting the essence of form through abstraction would be one of the major directions of art in the 20th century. While many artists would turn to pure abstraction, painters like Henri Matisse and Giorgio Morandi will continue to use objects as a subject matter in their work while experimenting with the expressive possibilities of visual form.
Having been insulated from the physical destruction that Europe experienced during the World Wars, America became an industrial and economic powerhouse after World War II. In peacetime, factories were free to produce cars, refrigerators, TVs, and many other consumer items. Convenience and comfort was the name of the game, and time-saving products were part and parcel of a rising middle class. Capitalism was booming, and stuff was king. This rampant consumerism began to influence the work of a number of American and English artists in the 1960s. They began using imagery from the popular media and advertising of the times in their work. This low imagery had never been part of fine art before. Was this even art? We're looking at one of the single canvases from a series of canvases of the Campbell Soup Cans by Andy Warhol from 1962 at the Museum of Modern Art. And one of the really important questions that comes up about especially modern art is, well, why is this art? When you ask me that, a bunch of things kind of surface in my brain. It, it does evoke something in me, so I, I'm, I'm inclined to say yes, but then it, there's a bunch of other things that say, well, if I didn't see this in a museum and if I just saw this in the marketing department of Campbell Soup, would you be viewing it differently? Because it's advertising then. Yes. But in the context of the museum or in the context of Andy Warhol's studio, it's not quite advertising, right? Even if it's the exact same thing. Yeah. And the idea here is by putting it in the museum, it's saying, look at this in a different way. Well, that's it's, right. It really does relocate it. It does change the meaning. It does transform it. And that's really one of the central ideas of modern art, is that you can take something that's not necessarily based in technical skill. Because I don't think you would say that this is beautifully rendered. Right. But it relocates it and makes us think about it in a different way. And so... I guess he would get credit for taking something that was very almost mundane, something you see on everyone in everyone's cupboard and making it a, a focal point. Like you should pay attention to this thing. I think that's exactly right. And I think that he's doing it about a subject that was about as low a subject as one could go. I mean, cheap advertising art was something that was so far away from fine art, from the great masters. And then to focus on something as lowly as a can of soup and yes. and cream of chicken, no less. Right? <laughs> and and I mean, you know, a lot of it is, if, if you did it fifty years earlier, people thought this guy's a quack. And if he did it now, they they think he's just derivative. And right, I mean, it was really just that that time where people happened to think this was art. Well, I think that that's right. In 1962, what Warhol is doing is he's saying, what is it about our culture that is really authentic and important? And it was about mass production. It was about factory. He, in a sense, said, let's not be looking at nature as if we were still an agrarian culture. We're now an industrial culture. What is the stuff of our visual world now? Looking back 50 years, it's hard to understand if these artists were celebrating the American consumer society or looking at it with a sardonic eye. Andy Warhol claimed that there was nothing behind his work, but in retrospect, his work is seen as a brain-inviting commentary on the banality of American life at the time. In our world today, there are many problems caused by the distribution of wealth. Political and economic theories vie with one another for dominance, and one system may work well for some, but at the expense of others. It's a complicated world. While art may not be able to solve these types of problems, as we have seen, it can provide a window on the times. Ironically, much of the art we have seen is now so valuable that only the super rich could afford it. Have artists that have commented on the indulgences of wealth been co-opted by their patrons to justify their own social position? We should think about the question this raises. What and who is art for? <laughs>